Hi everybody and welcome back. In today's video we're going to continue our discussion about bloating. Particularly, we're going to focus in under the umbrella of things that will typically cause postprandial bloating or bloating after meals. Now this could be within a couple minutes after your meal or hours after your meal. But if your bloating has any semblance of a pattern around meal times and you wake up with a relatively flat tummy in the morning, then this video is for you. This is actually part three of a multi-part series. So if you haven't watched mo module video one and two yet, go ahead and check those out first and then come back to this video and we'll continue the discussion about microbes as the primary driver of your bloating. Okay, so what conversation about bugs would be complete on this channel if we didn't first mention SIBO? For those of you who are new, SIBO stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Normally, there should be a smattering of a few bacteria here or there throughout the small intestine, and the colon should be chock full of bacteria. By the time you get to that point, it's a jamboree of bacteria. But in the case of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you could think of it as this kind of a situation, where now you have more bacteria, a larger quantity of bacteria, and also a mismatch in the good and bad bacteria that starts to creep up into parts of the small intestine where frankly, they don't belong. So that's your little primer on SIBO. And here's kind of the gist of the whole bacteria situation. Your bacteria, or the B in SIBO, are good. They help you digest food every single day. They're not the enemy. They're not doing anything bad. They're actually not behaving badly at all when they help you digest food. That's exactly what you would want them to do if they lived in the right house. But the fact that the bacteria are displaced and are living in the wrong part of the tube means that you get weirdo symptoms when a normal thing occurs. So normally food comes in the food hole, goes through the esophagus, the stomach, the small bowel, and then it waits until it gets to the colon when it hits the microbiome population. And now the colon is able to expand and contract and tolerate some gas bubbles and tolerate metabolites from bacteria, and it can contain that, and it's cool with that because it's the colon. That's what it was meant to do. But as soon as we start expecting the small intestine to do the colon's job, things get weird because the small intestine was not built to expand and contract in the same way that the colon was. It's not meant to be the frat house for bacteria. The small intestine is where you should be absorbing the majority of your nutrients and you should be interacting with the microbes and the immune system to some degree, but it shouldn't be nearly to the extent of the bacterial frat house that is the colon. So the thing with SIBO, it's not the bacterial being bad. It's not the bacteria misbehaving or doing something that we wouldn't want them to do. It's literally just that when they make these metabolites, including gas, in the wrong place, the gas gets trapped. And now you have gas bubbles that are not close enough to the mouth to exit as a burp. They're not close enough to the anus to exit as flatulence. It's just trapped and we have to wait until the gas dissipates and gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And that takes time and it's very uncomfortable. So SIBO bloat is not intrinsically part of the pathology in a weird way. It's, it's, it would be perfectly normal. If we could just transplant all these bacteria down, life would be fine again. But I will also beg this question of you. If you are treating SIBO and you assume that it's a bacteria problem, you are so incorrect in that treatment plan. And I would encourage you to go binge watch more of my videos. SIBO is not a bacteria problem. It's not like your bacteria were behaving one day and that one fateful Tuesday, your bacteria was like, ha 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 ha, let's go get them boys. Ha ha ha. And then it started to crawl up. Something had to happen to allow the bacteria to go up into the wrong house. Your motility had to fall to a level that is not gonna sweep away the bacteria. You had to suppress your stomach acid with a PPI. Food poisoning might've triggered autoimmunity for you. There was adhesions or scar tissue. Something had to happen to make your motility and that cleansing mechanism fail to the point where bacteria got to bubble up. But it's not like the bacteria did anything different than they normally would do. Something about you changed and you need to evaluate what that was or what that is currently in order to treat the SIBO. 
you could try to nuke the SIBO with antimicrobials from now until doomsday, and you're going to have very limited success until you turn the mirror towards you and you realize that mu much more of the work is going to come from correcting your own body and making sure that your protective mechanisms are in place so you don't get SIBO again. So that is my little primer on SIBO. So yes, bacteria gobbling up food, fermenting gases or fermenting fibers like FODMAPs will create gas that will create bloating and you can get the classic SIBO bloating, that postprandial bloating that especially comes up when people eat fiber or FODMAPs or carbs. But it's not necessarily that that is intrinsically a bad or wrong thing. It's just we need to get the bacteria down to the colon where they belong and you're largely going to do that by working on your own stuff and your motility. So for what it's worth. Number two is what I would call a microbial mismatch. All right. And this, honestly, I think is quite a bit more common. And it's even common within the world of SIBO. So this can come about for a couple of different reasons. But you can kind of think about a lot of systems in the body, including the microbiome, as a seesaw, where there's a ratio of good and bad and as long as they're in some kind of hippy-dippy yang-yang balance, everybody's happy. But if that balance gets thrown out of whack, then start, it, stuff starts to go south. So if you think about a mismatch between your food and your microbes, oftentimes this will present itself. Like let's say this is the normal situation between let's say good and bad bacteria. Just really simplistic view some degree of balance between the two is, is reasonable. But let's say that you have eaten a lot of junk food in your life, and I will confess, <laughs> I'm not that much better. Um, I ate a lot of bear claws and a lot of Pop-Tarts back in my day, so I'm not gonna brag. But say that you have led a life where you have eaten a lot of bad junky foods, refined sugar, a lot of salt, not a lot of fiber, not a lot of color, a lot of saturated fat and things that will induce leaky gut, a lot of gluten and dairy. That was like all my diet growing up, side note. But if you've eaten quite a lot of junk food and a lot of processed refined shit food, then you're gonna grow a microbiome over your life that has a lot more bad bacteria and fewer good bacteria because frankly, the good bacteria don't have food. So why would they hang out with you? They're not dumb. So you have this little dwindling baby population of good bacteria that are going to help you digest things like fiber and polyphenols and carbs. And you have a lot of bacteria that are all too happy to scarf down Twinkies and French fries and potato chips and chocolate or whatever it might be. So then if you all of a sudden say you're a normal person and you've been eating this way and eating ice cream every day for 20 years, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, it's the new year's. I'm going to go out of cleanse <laughs> or I need to lose weight for my sister's wedding or I need to lose weight for my wedding or whatever it is. And then you decide to do a whole 30 or a cleanse or a juice fast or something. These little guys are going to be shell shocked. Honestly, they're going to be so confused because you have fed them a lifetime of junk potentially. And then all of a sudden you're throwing in like cauliflower and sweet potatoes and rutabagas and God knows what. And they're going to go, whoa, we don't know what to do with this. And now you're going to get a lot of very confused bacteria that are making a lot of new metabolites and a lot of new gases. Your, your tube, your small intestine and colon have not seen these metabolites in a very long time, if ever. So now your body and your machinery is very confused with all of this new stuff. Your microbiome is very confused and struggling to try to do its job. And then you feel like crap and you feel bloated because you just had the biggest salad of your entire life when in actuality you had not had a lot of roughage for the prior 20 years of your life. So with those situations, you still need to get yourself, you know, over here. You still want to arrive at this situation where you have many more good bacteria and many fewer bad bacteria but it's not gonna happen overnight. You can't go from here to here in the span of a day and eat giant salads and like <laughs> giant bowls of Metamucil and expect it to happen overnight. It just doesn't work that way. 
So that is one thing too, is if you don't have overt SIBO, one thing that can happen is that people will get really excited and motivated to do the right thing and to do the healthy thing. But if they have this wicked dysbiosis from years and years of eating junk, like a lot of us do, it takes a lot of time. The typical like Instagram, New Year's cleanse kind of thing really can throw your microbiome for a heck of a loop. And then you feel bloated and then people erroneously assume, oh, fiber is not for me or I am intolerant to fiber. And then they might fall down the rabbit hole of, do I have SIBO? Oh my God, do I have this? Do I need to take antibiotics? When in actuality, it's just that your body and your microbiome are just shell-shocked. And if you had gradually made this transition over the course of a couple of weeks, then you could have gotten there a lot more easily. But, you know, I, I think it's wonderful when people are motivated to make change. But, you know, and I know that people oftentimes will have an easier way going about this if, you know, if, if they have cravings for junk food and then they do a cleanse and it motivates them and it keeps them honest and it keeps them in line until the new habits are formed. Like I get that there's some psychology at play here of trying to motivate yourself to make these changes. But if it's at all possible, it's going to be a much smoother endeavor if you can try to add two or three new vegetables to your diet per week or swap out one meal per week for a healthy choice instead of the junk that you were eating versus going from three unhealthy meals a day, seven days a week to salad for breakfast, lunch, dinner every day. Like that's, that's not going to go smoothly for a whole lot of people. So if that has been the case, it might not be that you're intolerant to fiber. It just might be that you have a mismatch between the microbes that you have cultivated for many years and the new diet that you're trying to follow and the microbiome that would be better matched with that new diet. So if you could get the mismatch corrected and make a more gradual transition or maybe supplement with some digestive enzymes or some prokinetics or some HCL or do some other techniques like mindful eating while you're making that shift, I think that would go a really, really long way. But don't, don't think automatically if you're quote unquote intolerant to fiber that that is an ingrained forever thing or don't automatically jump to SIBO. It just might be that your poor body is shell-shocked. And that's all right, just give it a little bit of time. You would be pretty shocked too if you had to deal with a whole new cuisine all of a sudden. And last but not least, I have one more thing to throw into the mix here. So we have the possibility of SIBO, question mark for some people here, microbial mismatch between the diet that you're trying to feed your microbiome and the microbiome that you may have been cultivating for many years up until this point. And then part of what can go under the microbial mismatch so I guess it could be a bullet point, is going to be antibiotics. So that is a great example where maybe you were here and you were doing reasonably okay with the amount of fiber you were ingesting, and then you took an antibiotic, you wiped out your good bacteria, and now you're scratching your head because now you're intolerant to fiber. Again, you kind of have to approach it in a similar way of like, all right, either if you're here, if you were here, pre-antibiotics, then you took antibiotics and it landed you here, maybe you just need to gradually work your way back to this and start working in the Brussels sprouts and the roughage gradually again. Or maybe you just need some probiotics or some digestive enzymes or a prokinetic or a probiotic or something, HCL, to help you process your food in the meantime while you're trying to take the seesaw from here to here to here right? So don't forget that antibiotics can also do this to some degree. And again, bloating after meals that is of a microbial nature doesn't necessarily guarantee that you have SIBO. But if you have other symptoms of SIBO, it might be really worth your while to look into that, at least take a gander at it and see if that's there. And then you can certainly work on your motility and your gut-brain axis and your SIBO root causes until you get the SIBO under control. But I hope that this offered a little bit of clarity on the bloating situation. I know that bloating is awful and miserable and it can make you really self-conscious and it can be painful for a lot of people too and i really hope that this offered some clarity around the topic of bloating and helped you helped you triage what your bloating is trying to tell you and most importantly how you can overcome or treat that thank you so much and i'll see you in the next video
Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.